Flying Ghost Cellars is, you know, is actually been around 20 years, but um, I've been in the business 40 years. So the first 20 years, I actually worked in Northern California and Oregon. And so how I got in the wine business, I went to UC Davis, which is uh, a school up in uh, Northern California, which is known for viticulture and enology, which is the winemaking school. And my roommate was a winemaker. So I followed him into the wine industry on his suggestion. So I got a job in Napa Valley in 1981. And that was my introduction to winemaking. I did construction work at a winery. So banging hammers and removing buildings and taking part. And that was the introduction. And I really enjoyed working in Napa Valley. And so I eventually looked for a job at a winery. And uh, I started in a cellar called Monticello Cellars in Napa Valley in 1982 was my first harvest and really fell in love with uh, the production, working with your hands and the science and the chemistry and being involved with the agriculture of farming. And not that I do a lot of farming per se, but just being involved, it was very exciting for me. And to make a product that you can consume and enjoy. And part of it, as I learned at Monticello Cellars, was that we, Thomas Jefferson was very active about food and wine. And I, I love to cook, I love to eat good food. And so I learned a lot about, from that particular winery and that experience about food combinations and how to produce wine that's gonna enhance food and how it's gonna work with food. So that was really a, kind of an eye-opening experience <clears throat> just because it becomes very artisanal and very personal. And to me, that's really exciting. Uh, you know, because how, how your palate comes through and how you taste things is very, it's an interpersonal thing. And then you sharing that with other people is very important. So that was really kind of a really good foundation for me and what I'm doing with the business now. So I worked in Napa Valley uh, in the 80s and I learned about making Pinot Noir. And that was really intriguing to me. And that was part of the, where Flying Goat is now because I love working with a grape. Uh, I love the wines, I love the expression, I love how hard it is to make wine from it. It's always a challenge and it's never, it's never easy. You know, I made Cabernet and I made Zinfandel, and I made uh, Petite Syrah, and I made those wines. I like those wines, but Pinot Noir was much more um, subtle and much more um, very unpredictable. And I think that to me was very fascinating. And also when I was there, I actually learned to make sparkling wine. And to me, that was also very, scientific and very interesting so you know those early beginnings for me in napa valley were kind of you know the reason i think where we are right now with flying goat cellars um, so i continued on i worked in the russian river valley in the late 80s as a winemaker and started making more pinot noir there and learning about the the nuances of what happens in the vineyard and how the trellising works and the different clones of pinot noir and that became very uh, the sciences were coming along too. The people in the vineyards are understanding that if you got more sunlight in there, the phenolic compounds in the grapes would ripen better. If you didn't have so much crop, the grapes would taste much better. And the orientation in the vineyard and the different, the different clones in the area that worked better for that particular soil type, which was really you know, very interesting to me. And then from there, I actually worked in Oregon for eight years. I took a job up there as a, wine, a winemaker. And the climate up there is so much different than Northern California. It's much more cooler. It's much more, uh, being farther north, it becomes much more challenging to uh, grapes, get grapes to ripen and get the flavors you like. So for me, it was a, a much more, another learning experience. Um, I think in California, we're a little spoiled because it's easy to get grapes to ripen here. In Oregon, it is, it was, the years I worked there was very difficult and very challenging. So you were looking for a balance of flavors and sugars. And you know what that balance was in order to achieve what you were going to make as an ideal, you know, wine. And I think for me that was really. Um, it sometimes is scary because here you are in the middle of October, and you haven't picked any grapes, and you're kind of waiting, and it's it's you know it's drizzling outside. <laughs> you're like, okay, what are we going to pick? <laughs> it's only 22 sugar, and it doesn't quite taste right. So you had to really be very patient and uh, you know, be a little bit more uh, you know, strategic in how you were gonna make the wines. So I think, I feeling you know, those experiences really helped me. So when I did come down to Santa Barbara in 1998, I was really, um, 
I was really grounded in what I wanted to do as far as winemaking. I had no intention of starting a winery. I was very happy being a winemaker and working at Foley Estates when I got here in 1998. And for me, that was exciting because I came here to the Santa Rita Hills, which is just this new growing region. Santa Rita Hills is the, was kind of up and coming. So to, I thought to be on the part of this up and coming growing region was very exciting. Uh, Santa Rita Hills is the only diurnal valley in all western United States, uh, meaning it runs east-west. All your growing regions here in California run north-south. Napa Valley runs north-south. Russian River Valley runs north-south. Willamette Valley runs north-south. Santa Rita Hills runs east-west, which is really quite fascinating because we have the Pacific Ocean right out there, and we have the San Inez Mountains in here. And during the summertime, as we'll see today, it's probably going to be 90 to 100 degrees in San Inez, and that hot air will rise, and it'll pull that cold air from the Pacific Ocean all the way through the Santa Rita Hills and cool the, and actually draw the cold air in, and that's what makes this great area so unique for, for Pinot Noir. Uh, besides the soil type, and also it's just a very cold mass of water out there, and that cold mass keeps this area cool, and that's why it's such a good area for Pinot Noir, and that's why I think it's, it's also great air conditioning. We don't have to air condition our buildings around here, so uh, we like that from a production standpoint. But I think getting back to just the whole idea of being here in Santa Barbara County, being part of this kind of upswelling of this new region, and also you know, having Pinot Noir as a background for me has always been exciting, and I think that's part of the reason what I think uh, helped me grow Flying Goat Cellars. Um, also, the sparkling wine was something that uh, I felt was important. Uh, nobody was making sparkling wine in Santa Barbara County, and I'm, I'm realizing there's some really good Pinot Noir grapes around here and good Chardonnay grapes, and they taste really good at low sugar. Because for sparkling wine, you need to put it at a lower sugar. And I'm thinking, tasting these grapes like, why is anybody making sparkling wine? You know, this make a good sparkling wine. And then one day I said, well, why don't you make it yourself? You know how to make it. And it was like, so that in 2005, I made my first vintage of sparkling wine. A lot of people thought it was a little crazy. And we only made 75 cases. And it came, to, it t came out really good. And uh, it was uh, very surprising how the reception was quite good. And uh, lo and behold, you know, you fast forward now 15 years, we make 1,000 cases of sparkling wine. And now there's over 20 sparkling wine producers in Santa Barbara County. So I feel like I was on the cutting edge of something. Uh, as far as something new here in Santa Barbara County, introducing a new style of wine, that's, which I, to me is, uh, I love sparkling wine. I love starting a meal with sparkling wine. I love having sparkling wine with different types of foods. I think you can use it across the board from cheeses to salmon to fish to, to light meats to dessert. So I, I think there's a place for sparkling wine in the food spectrum. And I think for me, it's, it's introducing, it doesn't have just to be for breakfast, I mean, for a, a special occasion for a birthday or New Year's. I think you can have it all the time. So I think that's our philosophy behind having it here at the winery.